Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Unauthorized Disclosure. I am one of your hosts, Rania Kalik. I'm joined by the show's other host, Kevin Gastola. Hello, hey. Kevin. <laughs> and of course, you'll notice that there's a third face with us if you're watching. It's Ben Norton, assistant editor at The Gray Zone. And of course, a guest we've had on the show before. Welcome back, Ben. Always glad to be here. Thanks for having me. It's it's fun to, to participate in unauthorized disclosure of, of illicit materials. <laughs> exactly. And, do, exactly. And, doing so from, and doing so from Ecuador. Exactly. No, I mean, with the ELN and, you know, just don't, don't tell Colombia, don't tell Washington, we're, we're fine. <laughs> so speaking of Ecuador, um, you have done some really incredible reporting from there. Uh, you uh, are still in the country now. You're coming to us from Ecuador. Uh, there was elections recently, um, and you were there to cover the elections. You did some really excellent reporting before the elections. So I guess um, let's start with I, I literally I also interviewed you recently, so I'm going to do this to so ask you some of the same questions again. But I know there's been some recent developments to add. But I guess let's start by um, hearing from you about why the elections in Ecuador are important. What was at stake and who ended up winning? Absolutely. Well, the reason the elections here are so important is because in the early 2000s, there was a wave of progressive governments across Latin America that's known in English as the Pink Tide. Ecuador was a key player in the Pink Tide. The former president, Rafael Correa, who ruled from 2007 until 2017, was a socialist and anti-imperialist. He helped really fight poverty here in Ecuador. He helped, he helped create free universal education and healthcare and very high quality. Uh, he helped build infrastructure. So there was a massive progressive movement, but then also internationally, Correa was extremely important because Ecuador became the headquarters of the Union of South American Nations, UNASUR, which had its headquarters in Quito. And then Ecuador also joined an, an economic trade bloc in South America that tried to unite the countries of South America together and Central America ignoring or kicking out the U.S. middleman, and it was called the ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance, or trade for the people as opposed to free trade. And Ecuador was part of these institutions. But what happened in 2017 is that this right-wing president came in named Lenin Moreno, who was supposed to follow in the footsteps of Correa, but he did a total 180. He betrayed the Correista movement, the, the leftist movement here in Ecuador. He imprisoned and persecuted leftist politicians and exiled them. He imposed neoliberal structural adjustment programs. He took billions of dollars of loans from the IMF. He withdrew Ecuador from the Bolivarian Alliance, the ALBA, and from UNASUR, kicking out the headquarters, destroying these multilateral regional institutions. He became basically a puppet of the United States. And the results of that have been the worst economic crisis in modern Ecuadorian history. The GDP in 2020 shrunk by 11%, one of the worst COVID crises in the world with one of the highest per capita death rates. And the poverty rate has more than doubled in just four years under Moreno. And it's now 58%, more than half of the country is living in poverty, according to the United Nations. So this election is extremely important because the people here are tired of all these policies and they want their sovereignty back. The reality is that the Moreno government right now is a total puppet of the United States. And we saw that just, just broadcasted to the entire world two weeks before the election, which was on February 7th, two weeks before Moreno visited Washington for a week. And he met with the president of the IMF. He met with the neoconservative members of the Senate, including Marco Rubio and Bob Menendez. He met with the head of Latin America policy for Joe Biden's National Security Council, Juan Sebastián González. So it, this is a country that has really almost been colonized by Washington. And if the election can be free and fair, and we'll see what happens, then the leftist candidate, Andres Arauz, who follows in the footsteps of Correa and his progressive movement that he calls the Citizens' Revolution, if he wins, and, and all the polls show he should win, but of course, we'll talk about how undemocratic the elections are here, then Arauz can actually help bring back that pink tide. So it would be a huge victory, not only for progressive forces here in Ecuador, but for all of Latin America. 
And so I know that you did a, a, a piece that was focused on the fake opposition candidate, uh, and you were getting um, a lot of praise for your work digging into this history. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put this on the screen for everyone. So anyone who's watching this interview can uh, see what we're talking about here. But this was the uh, article that you did for Gray Zone. And uh, okay, that's uh, Yaku Perez. And, um, and this is the headline. We'll just put that up there about this fake eco-socialist candidate that's been aiding the right wing in Ecuador and has the full support of the United States. Uh, so I wanted to have you uh, dig into this for people and tell us who he is. Um, and But I think to maybe move the conversation forward a little bit, what do we know about how he fared in the election and his ability to force a runoff? And um, what, what do we know about the results? I mean, because it was odd the way that people were insisting there was going to be a runoff before we even had the full count. And the margin was so substantial for for, for Andres Arauz that he that, that it made it seem like, you know, it it was kind of unusual that there was so much certainty that there would be a runoff because we still hadn't finished tallying the results. Absolutely. There are so many irregularities and I don't have time to get into all the problems. I'll just briefly say that on election day on the 7th, there were extremely long lines, especially in working class and poor communities. I went to some middle class voting precincts in the capital Quito and it was clear that they were allowed to vote more easily with short lines, whereas people in Correista communities who support the progressive movement were forced to wait for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. And that's that was very clear in the community of Manabi, where there were just insanely long lines. People were being trampled. So the we need to understand that the government here, the Lenin Moreno government, backed by the United States, has viciously persecuted the leftist Correista movement. He has put dozens of fake charges against former President Correa, who's living in Belgium. And he has imprisoned the former vice president, Jorge Glass, who went on hunger strike for over 50 days and nearly died. He was hospitalized. He's still in prison on bogus charges. He exiled numerous elected members of the National Assembly and then filled their seats. He exiled elected mayors and other politicians. I mean, we're talking about massive persecution, authoritarian kind of dictatorship style persecution of the leftist Correista movement. And then the Moreno government, backed by the United States, systematically took over state institutions, especially the electoral bodies and the media. So the media here is uniformly anti-Correa, pro-right wing. And that is both mm -hmm. private stations, which are owned by oligarchs, which is common, and the public media is all viciously anti-Correa and publishes fake news as, as a kind of comical example. One of the fake charges that the Moreno government put against the former leftist president Correa was accusing him of psychic influence over his followers. I, I kid you not, that's not a joke. He was charged with psychic influence, influjo psíquico, which has now become a shirt. And like Correa's fans will have, they have Correa like, like the guy from X-Men or whatever, who's like, <laughs> like psychic influence, I'm trying to change your views. So, I mean, that's how farcical we're, we're talking about here. So meanwhile, Moreno also took over the main electoral body, which is called the National Electoral Council, the CNE. He kicked out, he purged all of the pro Correa uh, members of the CNE, and he replaced them with members of the party Pachacutic and the party Creo. Creo is the party of the right wing banker candidate, Guillermo Lasso. Creo is a, an extremely right wing party, and Guillermo Lasso is part of Opus Dei. He's an extreme right winger. He's also one of the richest people in Ecuador. He's an oligarch. He, in 1999, Lasso was finance minister during the massive crash that destroyed Ecuador's economy, that bankrupted millions of people, and that, that devalued the currency. So anyone who had their wealth held in the domestic currency, they lost all of their life savings. And then Ecuador in 2000 dollarized. And the official currency here is the US dollar. Speaking of 
you know, visual metaphors of U.S. neocolonialism. They don't even have their own currency. So mm. Lasso is the other right wing candidate. But I mentioned another party called Pachacuti. And this is where this candidate you mentioned, Yacu Perez, comes in. Yacu Perez is this kind of astroturfed candidate. Until 2017, his name was Carlos Perez. That's his birth name. But he changed his name to Yacu. He started growing out his hair and claiming indigenous heritage. I mean, people, I've been saying this in interviews, but if you had to pick someone you'd be most similar to in the United States, it would probably be like Kamala Harris. He, he's, he adopted this kind of like identitarian strategy, uh, combining neoliberal fake environmental politics with kind of identity politics. And he really, I mean, in many ways, not only is he an American, a North American creation in the sense that the U.S. government has sponsored his party and trained its leaders, Pasha Kutik, but also in the sense that he's using that same strategy. And in 2017, this candidate, Yaku Perez, he was at the time known as Carlos Perez and had short hair. <laughs> he, and if you, if you see a photo, you, you know what I mean? Like when, before he had like his fake like marketing campaign hoisted upon him, he just looked like any other politician. He had glasses, he had short hair, he had a suit on. And in 2017, Carlos Perez, Jacob Perez, said that he endorsed Guillermo Lasso, the right-wing ba banker, for president because he hates the Corrista movement so much. So now what we're seeing, and we can talk more about this, so I'll conclude the answer here, is that the Organization of America States, the OAS, which is a, an extremely biased body backed by the United States, largely funded by the United States, and the OAS played the major role overseeing the far-right military coup in Bolivia in 2019. Now, the OAS is meddling here in Ecuador and very clearly trying to encourage Guillermo Lasso, the banker candidate, and Yacu Perez, the astroturfed NGO fake left candidate, to unite in an alliance against the Correista movement. Uh, so uh, just before Rania gets in here and asks a question, uh, let me just put up this, what you're talking about with Perez. And uh, so, so this is, is, is yeah. this is the photo that you have of him. And then now, obviously, uh, if, if I go ahead and scroll up on your article, you have an image of what, you know, he's remade himself to look like that so that he can be the fake opposition candidate. Look like a hippie. He, like, he's got like the long hippie hair. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll Ooh, I, I like, by the way, I like the way you just had the three faces up. That was cool. Oh, oh well, yeah. we can, we can do that. I, like I mean, that. this is, that this is really the way, good. this is the way that um, Katie does her show. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I recognize that. Shout out to Katie Helper, friend of the show. Yeah, yeah. Katie Helper, friend of the show. Um, but yeah. It's... What, I'll steal this joke from Max. Max Blumenthal, my colleague, joked that. The only thing that Yaku Perez's image is missing is just walking around everywhere he goes with a mate gourd. <laughs> like, he should just perpetually do that. I should mention, speaking of astroturfed marketing, every rally that Yaku leads, every campaign rally, which is usually pretty sparsely attended because he doesn't have a huge following, he's almost always riding his bike. It's part of his image. He's always like riding his bike with his mask on. I mean, I guarantee you that there was like a think tank in Washington. Oh yeah. They, they like, they, they workshopped and like mm -hmm. focus grouped his image. A hundred percent. It is 100%. like Kamala. It's like Kamala. And then I see parts of like Mayor Pete and what he's doing too. Yeah. I think there's more of a better work going on there with the bike thing. Like I can't see Pete riding a bike like that. He's too, <laughs> he's too like rigid and like Christian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, anyway, uh, but no, it, it's, it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting attempt to sort of like co-op leftism. I think it's really fascinating the way it works in terms of using environmentalism. And we, we talked about this a little bit before Kevin, but I thought what you, or Kevin, I'm sorry, Ben, I can't tell white boys apart. I mean, we all have um, names. We're the same. <laughs> They're all the same. Ben, Kevin, whatever. No, but uh, but I think it's a really interesting dynamic. This using uh, this accusation of like extractivism, which is what this guy did, because it's not just coming from him. It's kind of like a, a global north leftist anarchist sort of thing to like really despise every state uh, and see just the state as inherently bad and. 
to like look at these developing countries that are poor because they've been colonized because they've had their resources stolen by like imperialist countries uh and to basically tell them you're not allowed to develop if you try to develop using your natural resources, that's extractivism and that'll pollute the planet as if they're the cause of climate change. It's like a really nefarious narrative. Yeah, absolutely. And we can look at people like Naomi Klein, who are the ones really pushing this narrative. And there are some people who, you know, write with Jacobin magazine, this idea that extraction is, is a key political problem and not, not, the fact that global north countries actually are responsible for the vast majority of carbon emissions, whereas countries even like Venezuela, which has huge oil reserves, is still responsible for a very tiny fraction of global carbon emissions. I should mention that the same people talking about this virtually never mentioned the largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels in the world, which is the U.S. military. Wait, what? I thought you were going to say that it's like... It's like Iran or something. Yeah, it's like U.S. military. No, it, it, yeah, I, no. I mean, it's it's so incredible. The U.S. military consumes more oil than more than one hundred countries around the world. Yeah, that's crazy. Because is it like I actually have a little like I don't even know what it is. Is it to keep their military bases running? Is it well, yeah. because of the weapons that because they're not they're not like manufacturing weapons. They're buying them. No, so it's, it's it's to keep all of the eight hundred U.S. military bases and the aircraft carriers and all the ships and all the planes running. I mean, think about how much oil a plane uses. Even, you know, right. we're often attacked if we take a civilian plane to go fly somewhere. Now imagine fighter jets. Imagine hundreds of jets run by the U.S. Air Force. They do regular exercises. Imagine those massive aircraft carriers. Imagine the, sh the ships that the U.S. has constantly intimidating Iran in the Persian Gulf and intimidating China in the South China Sea. Imagine the the armored vehicles, the Humvees, the countless vehicles the U.S. has to occupy Northeast Syria. You always see those armored vehicles. Imagine how much oil all of these these weapons, I mean, they're weapons, really, consume. <laughs> yeah. And then compare that to a country that wants to use some oil extraction and mineral extraction to, to fund social programs to help poor people. I mean, it's so... I mean, it's pretty obvious which one of those we should be protesting. And I think it's the country trying to give its citizens healthcare. I mean, come healthcare. On. <laughs> yeah, I mean, wait, wait. I mean, wait, Ben. Uh, I've seen the images. If 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 we let ch China off the hook, because their air has been really dirty. I mean, remember those like big Rolling Stone photos in the clouds and the smog, and 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 so obviously we have to focus on them. Well, you know, well also wild, China right? does have China does have a military base outside of its borders. Yeah, like at yeah, least exactly. I think there's like one. It's got that we got to shut that shit down. I know. It's one well, military I mean, base too many. We also we we got to stop the Communist Party of China because they solved that problem and they keep solving problems and we can't let them do that. No, they yeah. They had all like this smog. Super fucked up. They yeah. had all this pollution. Where like, did oh, they put it? Where did they put the smog? They probably put it in Taiwan. Yeah. Or like Hong Kong. Hong Kong. <laughs> they like spray it at protesters. <laughs> right. They created this really bad weapon that was, by the way, was created by Uyghur forced labor. <laughs> um, they created a, a weapon that sprays the smog onto protesters in democratic countries that uh, support America. You know what I can't yeah. wait? I can't wait until, you know, like the harp machine conspiracy? Like the no. people are really into... H no, I haven't heard this. H A A R P. Like they, they thought that like there's like a we a weather weapon, and that the U S. That like, controlled weapon. by the Jews. Probably. I mean, they say the globalists, which is basically the same thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but I can't wait until liberals, liberal imperialists, repurpose the heart machine conspiracy against China, and like China yeah. has a weather weapon. China causes yeah, all a the. And a hurricane. It's okay. To, it's okay to use any like anti-Semitic trope. You just have to project it onto an adversary country and it's totally fine. Like Russia, Russia's Iran, Russia. Iran is like a, an octopus with tentacles wrapping around the world. I mean, these are things that like actual <laughs> people at think tanks would say. We, we China's all know drinking, trying to get his China, China's like harvesting Uyghur organs. When they're still alive, by the way. When they're Not still alive. When they're still alive. <laughs> And Russia, only Russia has oligarchs because American bankers mm -hmm. are peace-loving, yeah. humanitarian 
you know, great. Well, yeah, great. Bill Gates, like he makes a lot of money off of vaccines worldwide, but it's only because he wants to spread them. He wants, he, he loves. It's so amazing. So it's much. really. He wants them to stop being born. It's exactly. It's really incredible. The lies that we tell ourselves as a country. And I think like, um, I, I don't think you have to live outside of the United States to understand it, but I think having some distance from the U S as I'm sure like Kevin, the times that you've left the country, you've kind of probably noticed a little bit more just how absurd and delusional like American arrogance is like, we're always saying things like, um, not us, but like our leaders are always saying things. I must've heard it a million times at the, at the impeachment trial. Uh, America's the leader of the free world. <laughs> America's the leader of the, and it's like America's the leader of democracy in the free world. And I'm just thinking, like, did the world elect you? Like, who told? Like, it's like the the fact that we can even say we're like this amazing beacon of democracy and the leader of the free world when nobody in the world thinks that, except for like our puppets, and nobody elected us to be well, their leader. Well, Rania, the United States is the one Guaido of the world. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is true. That's uh, actually a beautiful metaphor. That should be the title. in so many ways. <laughs> Well, on a serious one, white of the world. But on a serious note, I mean, what you're saying isn't even just like humor, because Anthony Blinken actually has articulated this at least several times. It's apparently his mantra, um, and I never thought that like it would be so open and cleanly presented. But he just flat out says, "If we don't organize the world, it's going to be chaos." And so we have to be there because otherwise China or Russia is going to fill that vacuum and, and then we're not going to be able to trust them and their human rights records. And what's, and what's amazing about that, again, delusional, it's a delusional mentality that sees the world as us in them, right? It just shows you like how much liberals have really, um, have really like taken on the role of neocon because it really, it's this us and them view of like, of like everything's an escalation, everything's a war between the US and China and the US and Russia. And we project how we behave in the world as this like imperial power, this just like, this is the most violent empire in history. We project that onto Russia and China and assume that they have the same ambitions that we do. When if you look at the world, like the way, the way it looks, if you just like objectively look at it, you yeah. see the US would like, hundreds of military bases uh, around the world trying to dominate the fuck out of it, bullying every country that doesn't get in line. And then you see like Russia that's just kind of like trying to defend itself because the US has it surrounded by NATO. Um, and it's constantly trying to destabilize it by backing opposition figures like Navalny. And then you look at China where like the US is constantly trying to destabilize its neighbors um, by, you know, funding these destabilization efforts and China, like, and like, is like, you know, admonishing China for doing business with other countries when like China actually goes in and builds infrastructure and like, it, it doesn't, I don't see like, where are China's wars? Like I'm supposed to believe China is this big, bad enemy, but like, show me where China's causing a war. Like the U S is bombing so many fucking countries you know, and a statement say, accusing China of military aggression. Incredible. Like where, where, because it's because it wants to have some, some, some level of control over the water that it like share it, that is at its border. Like the U S has China surrounded by like, you know, it's little puppet regimes in Asia, as well as I think like two thirds of American naval assets are, are, are surrounding China right now. And it's just it's like, it's still what's delusional is that people believe this shit. Like it's like the objective reality is in your face, but then you have this entire network of like corporate media outlets that just give you this backwards upside down view of the world. And I guess if people hear it enough time, like even on the left, they get fucking arrogant and they really believe that, you know, if that Venezuela, if we let Venezuela be, then we're just letting China and Russia into our backyards. Like wh what kind of psycho mentality is that? But additionally amazing, I mean, additionally amazing is that we actually think we're doing a good job of organizing the world or that like the United States is capable of having that kind of influence because, and, you know, which is what Gray Zone and the work that you're doing, Ben, is completely committed to is like the effect of this 
But it's also clear when you look at like Venezuela and these other countries that we're just that, that the U.S. just isn't succeeding. Like, I mean, and, and to some degree, they're inflicting harm. Obviously, there's a lot of suffering. There's death. But Venezuela, not able to impose Juan Guaido in Bolivia, beat back by um, the, the, the left wing movement there. So I, I think, you know, if, if you don't mind, Ronnie, I'll have Ben move on to. Uh, Sorry, address... I, get ra- I get rambly when it comes to American arrogance. I don't know no, why. It's, it's, it's the best part. No, I, and I think if you want to add more on U.S. arrogance, that's that's absolutely fine. Uh, but as, as far as um, well, how many hours do we have? Like five. Yeah, I know. I don't think you have yeah, time like, for it. Throw out a marathon, like twenty-four hour live stream marathon. If if we were just going to do that, but uh, the but but Arauz who uh, so so Andres who 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 won. Um, can you describe some of what he stands for? And 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 flesh out this the whole reasons why the U.S. would deem it a threat if he would. T- I mean, it's, some of it is self evident and obvious because of the fact that he is aligned with the Coriesta movement. But um, just just specifically, what are the things that he's endorsing and backing that 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 are obvious reasons why the empire wants to crush him as in his campaign? Absolutely. This is the integral question. I mentioned that one of Washington's most pernicious roles has been trying to undermine regional institutions. I mentioned that the Union of South American Nations, UNASUR, had its headquarters here in Ecuador in the capital Quito that was expelled by the Lenin Moreno administration backed by the United States. And even more importantly than that, that's a political alliance, is the economic alliance, which is called the Bolivarian Alliance, the ALBA. And a quick, quick history on that, really brief. In 2003, under the Bush administration, the United States was trying to negotiate a massive neoliberal trade agreement that was just like NAFTA, but was applied to all of the Americas, North, Central, and South America. So the U.S. wanted to create a so-called free trade zone, or as you could actually call it, a free exploitation zone, removing all tariffs, all protectionism, all barriers to U.S. capital, So the U.S. could just dominate and recolonize all of Latin America. And that was called the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas, FTAA. Or in in Spanish, it was called the ALCA, A-L-C-A. This was at the beginning of the pink tide of progressive governments in the region. And Hugo Chavez, the relatively new president in Venezuela, opposed this. He said it was an attack by U.S. imperialism. In Bolivia, the leftist indigenous leader, Evo Morales, said it was an attempt by the United States to colonize Latin America. So in 2004, a year later, Venezuela and Cuba, then under Fidel Castro, created the Bolivarian Alliance called the ALBA, which which it, the ALCA was the U-Trade, A-L-C-A was the U.S. free trade agreement. The ALBA with a B, A-L-B-A, was their response, and it was an attempt to challenge U.S. imperialism and neoliberal policy in the region and create a nationalist trade bloc of left-wing governments in Latin America that would do business with each other economically. Ecuador was a key part of the ALBA. And when Moreno came in, he withdrew from the ALBA and took billions of dollars of loans from the IMF. So clearly the United States, one of its primary priorities is preventing Ecuador from returning to the ALBA and returning to the to UNASUR and allowing the headquarters to come back to Ecuador. Moreover, Correa, when he was president from 2007 to 2017, as we were talking about in terms of geopolitics and and so-called great power competition, which has become the Pentagon's favorite talking point, Correa worked a lot with China because, surprise, surprise, if if you sign a deal with a North American corporation to try to build a bridge or something, it probably won't even finish It'll be over budget, it won't work right. Whereas if you build infrastructure with China, they'll build your bridge in like seven days and they'll go under budget. So Korea was working with the People's Republic of China to develop infrastructure projects and, and other projects here in Ecuador. And, and Arauz, the leftist economist, has already said that he is going to refuse to pay the IMF the more than $6 billion of debts that have accrued in just the past few years under Moreno and instead work with China. So 
that for U.S. imperialism, that's a that's a huge threat in scare quotes, right? Because Ecuador is refusing to abide by the by the neoliberal rules established by the International Monetary Fund. We have to understand that the IMF is effectively an appendage of the U.S. It's, it, the U.S. has veto power over it. It's, it was created by the United States at the Bretton Woods Conference. So the IMF is the vehicle through which the U.S. imposes neoliberal policy across Latin America, forcing governments in order to pay their untenable debt, forcing them to privatize state assets, to open markets, to remove restrictions, to allow foreign capital to just enter the country and exploit it. And, and the young leftist economist, Andres Arauz, the leading presidential candidate, he previously worked in the Correa administration. He's a PhD in economics, like Correa, who is also a leftist economist with a background in, in socialist economics. And they're not going to play ball. And that's exactly why the United States is so dedicated to preventing them from coming back into power not only because of all the things I mentioned, but because if Ecuador comes back, the major political and symbolic value that would mean for the international movement of progressive governments, the pink tide, the pink tide would really be back. I mean, you could say that if Ecuador and, and Brazil can come back, the pink tide is back. Mm -hmm. And uh, so based on what you've observed on the ground, you've been doing reporting, you're following this, you're looking at the ground and what is going to be happening as we go into the runoff election. What can you say about the view of the the, the left movements or the you know the wider um, organizing that has gone on in support of um, a rouse and uh, whether people who are in in Ecuador actually buy, Yaku Perez as a authentic figure. And in other words, do people know that he is posturing and is a, a, a figure that is a creation of the United States? And I guess to what degree do you believe the oligarch funded media will be able to get people to see him as a uh, someone who is per perhaps more genuine than Arrows. Well, we have to be clear, first of all, that I even according to the very unreliable, I'll say, vote count we've seen so far from the National Electoral Council, which I should stress again, has been deeply politicized under Moreno. This is not a democratic institution. But even according to their own vote account, Yaku only got around 20% of the vote along with the banker candidate, Guillermo Lasso. So even they're not trying to claim that Yaku is some great popular leader that Ecuadorians love. 20% is not, it's not a very good outcome. Now, I think the strategy, and it's very clear what the strategy is, is to unite the anti-Correa opposition candidates together in an alliance to try to win the election in the runoff in April of this year. And we've seen the Organization of American States, which was the key force behind the coup in Bolivia, which was a major force supporting Juan Guaido, the, the U.S. coup puppet in Venezuela, trying to overthrow the government there. The OAS has been meddling in Nicaragua as well. The, their strategy, the OAS has been meeting with the opposition candidates, Yacu Perez, Guillermo Lasso, and also another candidate who did surprisingly well with around 16% named Javier Pervas. The OAS is trying to get them to unite in a kind of big tent coalition, a neoliberal coalition against the leftist Correista movement. And we'll see if they're successful. I think that's actually very likely. Why do I say that? Because two days before the election on February 7th, the banker Lasso said that if Yacu Perez went to the second round, that Guillermo Lasso would support him. As I've also said before, in 2017, Yacu Perez when he was known then as Carlos Perez, supported Guillermo Lasso's candidacy. So there's already a history of them endorsing each other. I mentioned that there's another candidate here who kind of appeared out of nowhere with around 16% of the vote named Javier, Javier Ervas. Javier Ervas is from a party called the Democratic Left, but it's neither Democratic nor left-wing. I mean, it's a neoliberal party, like basically all of the non-Correista Correista parties here in in Ecuador. And 
Ervas on Twitter has already called for an alliance between him, Lasso, and Yaku. Lasso said on Twitter that he is willing to form an alliance. So I think it's a matter of time. Today is February 12th. I think that we're going to see a coalition form in the next several days with the backing of the United States and the OAS. I should mention another key detail here. After the election, Yaku Perez claimed, now of course we don't know if this is true, but he claimed it, it's pretty credible. Yaku Perez said that the US embassy called him and told him he's going to the second round. He's going to the runoff. That is incredible because if that's true, that's the United States going over Ecuador's own electoral body, which has not officially declared a second place candidate and determining who the candidate will be. Washington is determining who's going to run an Ecuadorian election. Well, it's only because the U.S. is the leader of the free world. Exactly. They can't trust their own puppets that they've installed in power and paid off to, to run elections for them. They just have to do it themselves. Yeah. Well, you can't, I mean, you can't I have the wrong, the, I think, you can't have the I wrong puppet run. I personally think that the U.S. should actually be the, like, I think Americans should run as candidates for elected office of other countries. Like Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 100%. Like, I think that, you know, I think that the, we should have American members of Congress be presidents of other countries, like imposed. Well, why isn't AOC should just be like the woke empress of the entire world? Yeah, I 100% am on board with that. Like she can just like give Medicare, you know, for all rhetorical support around the and world. Missiles. And missiles. Drop, drop medicine and missiles. She can universalize, <laughs> universalize missiles, yeah. But no, it's, it's completely outrageous. And it, it's, um, you know, it's interesting too, because like it just shows that the 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 continuation of US foreign policy there's a certain trajectory that it's on no matter who's in charge like had Trump been in office right now all of these same things would have happened like it just it just continues to on a certain course regardless of who's in power yeah i mean and that's the difference between a liberal critique of individuals and a systemic critique of the actual institutions that keep the US government going we can also look at the personnel I mean, the reality is that the State Department, the CIA, these are institutions that, that don't change. You know, liberals will criticize you for using the term deep state, but that's that's the state. I mean, these institutions never change under presidents. I mean, people retire, but the reality is that you know, the CIA is continuing to do the same work that it has always done. But then there's also the individuals we, we can talk about. I mean, the, the main person overseeing Biden's Latin America policy right now is a, an extremely right-wing Colombian-American named Juan Sebastián González. He also was, he recently worked with the Peace Corps in Guatemala, which is a huge <laughs> red flag, like the bad red flag, because anyone who knows about the Peace Corps, especially in Latin America, knows that it's often used as an intelligence front. And what was he doing in Guatemala? I mean, that's a really dangerous mix. The U.S. has supported genocide, literal genocide in Guatemala. I mean, the, the, the list of crimes in Guatemala goes back many decades to the US, the CIA overthrowing the elected president of Guatemala, Arbenz in 1954. So this is the guy overseeing Joe Biden's Latin America policy. And he met with the Ecuadorian leader, Lenin Moreno, when he visited Washington. In fact, Moreno's office posted, he, they tweeted out photos showing him meeting with Joe Biden's lead Latin America policy advisor. That's, that's an incredible, sign for me that they were clearly planning something. He also met with Luis Almagro. Luis Almagro, for people who don't know, this is the, the totally disgraced leader of the Organization of American States who oversaw a military coup, a fascist style junta in Bolivia. And Luis Almagro is still the leader of the OAS and he just moved on to plotting coups in other countries, in Venezuela, Nicaragua, and here, in Ecuador, he's meddling once again, encouraging the opposition candidates to unite, meeting with the opposition candidates here, the anti-Correa candidates. And Luis Almagro met with Lenny Moreno when he visited Washington at the end of January. It's incredible. I mean, it's so blatant. They're not even hiding it. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a, a, a couple, a, a few questions here. And Rania had to go. Uh, but I wanted to hit a few other countries and, and aspects of the Latin American foreign policy of the United States, which, as we're saying, isn't necessarily dependent on who is president at the time. But 
uh, obviously now this is all on Biden's plate and it's his responsibility that, that these things are unfolding. So I'm putting you on the spot just a little bit, but do you have any uh, reaction to the fact that uh, one of the first weapons deals being inked is for $85 million worth of Raytheon missiles to the Chilean military, along with supporting equipment and, 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 and training, et cetera. Um, I mean, What's what's the significance there as, as, in, in your work tracking where all, all the different countries and where they fit into U.S. foreign policy? What are we looking to have Chile continue to do for us and, and against the countries like Ecuador and Venezuela? Well, anyone who knows even the basics about modern Latin American history knows the role that Chile has played under the Pinochet dictatorship mm -hmm. in 1973 on the first 9-11, if you will the CIA overthrew the elected government of the socialist Salvador Allende I, there in, in Chile and installed a brutal fascistic regime under Pinochet, Agosto Pinochet. And still today, Chile actually has a Pinochet era constitution. Now, last year in 2020, the Chilean people voted in a referendum to rewrite the constitution. They're going through that process, but we're talking about a government that never de-pinochetized, if you will, never went through a full democratic transformation. Chile has one of the most neoliberal economies in the world. Even water is privatized. Virtually everything in Chile is privatized. It has one of the worst levels of inequality in Latin America with extreme poverty next to people who have extreme wealth. And the Chilean military is brutal. Chilean state security forces are brutal. Now, what they're going to do with Raytheon missiles, I have no idea. To me, this seems like more of a foreign policy decision to basically show their loyalty to the United States. But what we do know is that the military of Chile locally is extremely repressive. In the last few years, we've seen massive protests against the oligarch regime in Chile run by the president Sebastián Piñera. Piñera, who supported Pinochet, by the way, and when Pinochet was, there was an attempt to extradite him for crimes, he opposed the extradition of Pinochet and Piñera, the current president of Chile, back in the 90s, gave a speech in which he said, we should show our solidarity with Pinochet. I mean, this is the guy we're talking about. He's also a billionaire, one of the richest people in Chile, and a complete corrupt neoliberal who has been just continuing privatization policies as if they could still privatize things. And there were massive protests over neoliberal reforms, including the attempt to increase the, the price of the train and the buses in Chile. And that, that kicked off a massive uprising. And the response of the Chilean government was absolutely brutal. The Carabineros, which are the military police forces, were intentionally shooting hundreds of protesters in the eyes. And even the Chilean government's own human rights body, which is part of the government, acknowledged that the Chilean military and police were intentionally trying to cripple protesters. And hundreds of people have lost eyesight in one or both eyes. And also, and that, that's because the Carabineros, the Chilean forces were using illegal pellets that, that spray into shrapnel. So that's very hard to avoid them. And that's against international law. Chile also, the government also detained thousands of protesters arbitrarily. And there's videos of people that they, they posted online of them throwing protesters into unmarked cars, which is pretty terrifying because that's that recalls the Pinochet era, the dictatorship. And in fact, many people in Chile refer to the Sebastián Piñera regime as Pinochetista, as following in the footsteps of Pinochet. Finally, I should mention that, of course, the U.S. government under Trump strongly supported the Piñera regime in, in Chile, and not just the U.S., but also the OAS. I mentioned Luis Almagro, the, the, General Secretary, the Secretary General of the OAS. He had a very friendly meeting with Piñera, and in the meeting, they had the gall to criticize the so-called human rights violations committed by Venezuela and Nicaragua while he was meeting with the president of Chile, whose forces have blinded hundreds of its own citizens for protesting. Incredible. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so, and then the other thing, uh, an another country I wanted to ask you about is uh, Nicaragua related to the policy there. And uh, specifically, uh, you were following the Biden administration and its embrace of a Trump administration policy, although I wouldn't be completely stunned to learn that there were the seeds of this policy in the Obama administration, if you told me, but just a policy that the State Department has adopted. Um, um, oh, well, well, it, it's had a very aggressive opposition to Nicaragua. And then the thing that you were latching on to and, and, and talking about was the reaction from the State Department to this law that Nicaragua has in order to defend itself from the influence of foreign organizations that are, are, are basically agents that could be uh, involved in destabilization efforts. And the State Department is likening this to either authoritarianism or evidence of, of Nicaragua being a dictatorship. So can you can you break down um, you know what this is and 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 why I guess it's important for Nicaragua to have this kind of a law. It doesn't actually strike me as this thing that the US can really get upset about because we do have a law in our own country to have people register as foreign agents. Absolutely. Anyone who knows anything about Russiagate will remember that the US government under Trump, strongly backed by the Democrats, pushed by the Democrats, honestly, that the US government registered Russian media as a foreign agent, specifically RT, Sputnik, using a, an 80-year-old law called the Foreign Agents Registration Act, FARA. The Trump administration then did that to Chinese media. So in the past year, we've seen the US government repeatedly use its Foreign Agents Act to require journalists from Russia and China and other countries in the United States to register as foreign agents. Now, a few months ago, in October of 2020, the Nicaraguan government, and I should mention that it was actually the democratically elected National Assembly, not the president of Nicaragua, who's Daniel Ortega, the National Assembly passed a law that requires organizations funded by foreign governments to register as foreign agents. I wonder where they got that idea from. I mean, it's basically identical to the U.S. FARA law. But the U.S. government has been very angry because on February 5th, a major right-wing opposition group in Nicaragua, which has been funded with millions of dollars by the United States, announced that it's closing. And that's called the, the Violeta de Barrios Chamorro Foundation. Oh, vi sorry, the Violeta Barrios de Chamorro Foundation. Violeta Barrios de Chamorro is the former right-wing president of Nicaragua. Long story short is that after the Sandinista revolution, the socialist revolution in 1979, it overthrows a US-backed dictatorship. And then in the 1980s, the Ronald Reagan administration wages a terror war. The CIA arms and trains death squads known as the Contras, the counter-revolutionaries, to try to overthrow the government, massacring civilians, burning down hospitals and schools. I mean, it was an actual terror war. They even mined the harbor, mined the ports to destroy civilian and trade vessels in Nicaragua. An absolute terror war for which the International Court of Justice convicted the U.S. government and said that the U.S. government owes Nicaragua many billions of dollars in reparations, which, of course, Washington has never paid. But anyway, the point is that in the 1980s, the U.S. supported the National Endowment for Democracy, which was created by the Ronald Reagan administration as a CIA front to continue many of the CIA's same destabilization tactics. It was funding a right-wing oligarch that, from the Chamorro family. The Chamorros are one of the richest families in Nicaragua. They have traditionally had political power and they control the media. They're very wealthy, very rich. And Violeta Barrios de Chamorro, who was married to Chamorro, she became the president in 1990 following the U.S. terror war, and her campaign was funded by the U.S. government through the NED. And she came in and she privatized everything. She reversed the socialist policies. The NED gave her an award. Well, when she left the presidency in Nicaragua, she created a foundation called the Chamorro Foundation, named after the richest, one of the richest families in, Ecuador, in Nicaragua. And the U.S. government has continued to use the Chamorro Foundation as a pass-through to fund other right-wing opposition groups in Nicaragua. And, and I, I wrote an article about this at the Gray Zone, and you can see the numbers we're talking about. We're talking about just in the past four years, 
well over $5 million have gone from the United States through the fake humanitarian arm, USAID, the US Agency for International Development, into the coffers of this right-wing foundation. So th this is how, this is the strategy of how the US funds these NGOs and opposition groups. It's a way for Washington to literally pay the salaries of right-wing politicians in Nicaragua, mm -hmm. in Ecuador, in Bolivia. And the Chamorro Foundation announced on February 5th that in response to the new foreign agents law, that it's going to close, not because the government is forcing it to close, but because it's a voluntary suspension of operations in protest of the law. They refuse to register as a foreign agent, even though they're entirely funded by the U.S. government. So in response, the Biden administration, the State Department, released a, a very angry statement accusing the democratically elected socialist government of Nicaragua of being on the so-called path toward dictatorship. And who wrote the statement? This is another incredible irony. Ned Price. Who is Ned Price? He is a former CIA agent. People might remember his name because in 2017, he resigned from the CIA in protest of Donald Trump. And as soon as Biden won the election, his team selected the former CIA agent, Ned Price, to be one of the main spokespeople of the U.S. State Department. So in this, this statement, he accused Nicaragua of supposedly becoming a dictatorship, which is hilarious because the same day he released the statement in Haiti, the U.S.-backed government there of Jovenel Moïse as an actual dictatorship. And he declared himself a dictator, overstaying his permanent office the same time that the CIA agent turned U.S. State Department spokesperson, Ned Price, released a statement. He also falsely accused the Nicaraguan government of close, forcing the closure of this right-wing opposition group. Like I said, that's not true. It voluntarily decided to suspend operations in protest. And the, mm -hmm. the Biden administration blamed Daniel Ortega, the president of Nicaragua, the elected president, even though, again, it actually wasn't Ortega. It was the elected National Assembly, which has 92 members that are elected. So it's incredible because the United States is basically saying, if you close down these right-wing groups that back violent coups, and there was a, a violent coup attempt in Nicaragua in 2018 that left hundreds of people dead, and the Chamorro Foundation played a key role in bankrolling the right-wing coup-mongering forces, so the U.S. is saying, if you if you want, if you force U.S. government funded groups run by oligarchs that destabilize your country and plot coups, if you force them to register as foreign agents, you're a dictatorship. It's it's pretty wild. And then uh, just uh, a quick note on that. And then I have one question about Brazil to end our conversation here. Uh, but. Uh, obviously, you know, if we're looking at continuity in government, you, you look back at Mike Pompeo being the C CIA director and then making that very like easy move into being secretary of state um, and just, you know, bringing everything he was already working on at the CIA, it seems, over to the State Department. Um, and then now what you're saying with Ned Price, it just strikes me that people might be stunned to learn that there's a lot of synergy going on between the CIA and, and State Department, and that it's not just a straight up diplomatic core of people who are around, you know, to interact with foreign countries, that there's, that there is an agenda that could be coming from within the CIA, in fact, that they are carrying out for uh, the United States. Well, especially now that according to the Democratic Party, the CIA is woke. So <laughs> they love the CIA. Yes. So. And yeah. I mentioned that speaking of like the woke propaganda, Ned Price is openly gay and often broadcasts that. And he, he's mm -hmm. been part of this rebranding effort, a literal rebranding effort by the CIA. They changed their website. They changed their logo. They have the faces of black women talking about why you should join the CIA. And then they have Ned Price, who openly, frequently talks about how he's openly gay. So, I mean, we see the same kind of pink washing of the coup plotting agency that we talked about earlier with the kind of greenwashing of candidates in Ecuador. Uh -huh. All right. So for Brazil, the question that I wanted to ask you about was this news that we're seeing, uh, which, which uh, essentially we're seeing this news that says that uh, there's, you know, there's confirmation here. There's people who are talking about how 
uh, Lula da Silva, who was the leader of Brazil, um, the fact that he was arrested, that that was a gift to the CIA. Um, and in fact, we're, we're seeing more evidence, if not confirmation, that this was something that was CIA backed. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you uh, to, to summarize some of uh, of this and you know what, what you think it might mean for Brazil policy. Absolutely. The website Brazil Wire, which is the best English language resource on Brazil, published a really explosive leak this week that shows that the head of the task force of the so-called anti-corruption investigation in Brazil, Lava Jato, which is, which is what was used to launch a soft coup against the Progressive Workers' Party government in Brazil, the head of the task force thanked the CIA. He said that when the leftist leader Lula da Silva was imprisoned in 2018, which prevented him from being a presidential candidate, he said that was a gift from the CIA. We've known that the U.S. was involved for many years, and this goes back to the, the Barack Obama administration. What happened was in 2016, there was a parliamentary coup that removed the elected left-wing president of Brazil from office, Dilma Rousseff. She was from the party, the Workers' Party, which was co-founded by Lula da Silva. People who know about Brazil know that Lula is a labor organizer, revolutionary. He's the most popular leader in, the, in Brazil's modern history. I mean, he had up to 80% approval when, when he left office. Absolutely pop, popular figure. He helped fight poverty. He helped develop the country. He also helped support regional institutions that I mentioned that, that undergirded the pink tide. His successor, Dilma Rousseff, had some problems economically, particularly because the price of oil dropped. And a lot of these countries in Latin America relied on a commodities boom to fund their social programs. And the US forced Saudi Arabia to over pump oil through Saudi Aramco massively, which dropped the price of oil. And in return, the US agreed to give Saudi Arabia more weapons and support for the so-called rebels in Syria. Anyway, the point is that the Brazilian economy took a, you know, it, it was still growing, but it had some issues under Dilma Rousseff. And the right-wing opposition used that as an opportunity, along with actually, ironically, some of the same kind of astroturfed NGO fake left people who joined together to protest against Dilma Rousseff and eventually impeach her on bogus corruption charges. Now, what we've known for many years, Brazil Wire has documented this, is that the US government was involved in that, specifically the FBI and the Department of Justice were from the very beginning of the so-called anti-corruption investigation, Lava Jato, they were advising the Brazilian government. And specifically, they were advising the prosecutors, which are deeply anti-right, deeply right-wing and deeply anti-workers party, specifically Sergio Moro, Sergio Moro became, under the far-right Bolsonaro administration, he became the so-called super justice minister with enormous powers. And Sergio Moro and Jair Bolsonaro, after the election, when Bolsonaro won, they visited Washington and they took a trip to the CIA headquarters in Langley to thank the CIA clearly. So we now have confirmation from one of the chief prosecutors that imprisoned Lula da Silva in 2018, preventing him from being the presidential candidate and that helped Bolsonaro win the election. If Lula had been the presidential candidate, he would have easily won. All the polls showed him leading by 20% over Bolsonaro, who was a totally fringe figure. So what we saw and what we now have conclusive evidence is that the US government backed a coup in 2016 to remove Dilma Rousseff, which led to the neoliberal regime of Michel Temer, which was totally unelected. And then finally, it led to the imprisonment of Lula da Silva and the election in an unfair election of Jair Bolsonaro, who is probably the most fascistic far-right leader in all of Latin America, if not the world right now. Mm -hmm. So the US platformed a fascist because- Un uh, Under yeah. Obama. That was yeah. all under Obama. Yeah, because actually, if you look at the censorship going on right now on social media, um, is, is Jair Bolsonaro, he hasn't been taken off of social media. I mean, he's, he, he's, but theoretically, if he was American, you would have to remove him for like what he says on a daily basis, right? Like 
they, they'd have to purge him from social media to protect us all, right? I mean, he's even way more extreme than Trump. Yeah. Bolsonaro has has proposed so many quack forms to try to cure to try to cure COVID. Like, what was it, the hydrochloroquine or whatever? But like, <laughs> but like Bolsonaro took it to a whole new level. Bolsonaro regularly incites against elected members of his own government, of the National Assembly, of the parliament. I mean, he, he says regularly homophobic and racist things, but of course he's not going to be banned. He's too useful. All and right. I, wait, I should mention what, one last thing. Before Mike Pompeo left office, he, he was doing this Twitter thread that was bragging about all the things that, all the evil things the State Department did under his leadership. And one of the things that he boasted was Mike Pompeo said, thanks to us, the U.S. government, Narendra Modi, the far-right prime minister in India, and Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, thanks to all of us, the BRICS no longer exists. The BRICS is, is, was destroyed. BRICS refers to Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. The BRICS, hmm. B-R-I-C-S. This was an international alliance created by those countries that included a, a bank, a developmental bank, a trade block. They were trying to develop the economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa together by, so by going around the World Bank and the IMF. It was a challenge to the US-dominated hegemonic order created in the Bretton Woods Conference. And, and Pompeo boasted mm -hmm. that thanks to the far-right leaders that the US supports in India and Brazil, the BRICS is really mostly a memory now. So for me, we were talking about the role of Ecuador and all of this and geopolitics. It's not just about installing a right-wing oligarch president. It's also about preventing the emergence of multilateral regional institutions like the BRICS, like ALBA, and like UNASUR. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Ben. We really appreciate all of your reporting and coverage of the Global South. And um, I'll just say, as uh, I conclude uh, without Rania, that uh, people can go to uh, our Patreon at patreon.com slash unauthorized disclosure. We also have a presence on Rockfin, um, still experimenting and seeing what we think about that. Um, and so that's where you can go if you want to support this show. And I'll be back next week with Rania for another episode.